Bueno, buenos días, Jeff Freeman. Gracias por haber venido a la Universidad de Oviedo. Es un placer que estés aquí con nosotras. Um, si te parece, vamos a empezar con la entrevista. Lo primero que me gustaría preguntarte es que comenzaste tu trayectoria en el movimiento por la defensa de los derechos civiles en Estados Unidos, que fue uno de los principales movimientos del siglo XX y también un movimiento precursor que estuvo en la base de, del surgimiento de los nuevos movimientos sociales. La pregunta es, ¿qué hizo que una joven como tú se decidiera dar el paso de implicarse y participar tan activamente en este movimiento? My mother was born and raised in Alabama, which is a deep south state. She took me to California when I was six months old, but she did not believe in segregation. And when the civil rights movement emerged in the south, she very often told me that segregation was wrong. So I grew up hearing her say that the south had made a wrong turn on race and needed to turn around and go the other way. I absorbed that idea from my mother. Um, when I was a college student at Berkeley, the civil rights movement hit the news very big in 1963. There was the demonstrations in Birmingham, Alabama, an assassination of a major civil rights figure in Mississippi, the March on Washington, mm -hmm the bombing of the church, and the death of four little girls. The student political organization that I was a member of uh, wanted to do something. Mm -hmm. So we looked around in the liberal Bay Area, and we found a lot to do. Over the next two years, I was involved in many demonstrations and was arrested three times, mm -hmm. had three trials. Um, so when I graduated in 1965, it seemed only natural to go back south and work for the Civil Rights Movement. Mm -hmm. Now, many people have heard of Freedom Summer, which was in 1964. Most people don't know that there was, in effect, a second Freedom Summer in 1965. Mm -hmm. And in the second Freedom Summer, the major civil rights organizations each had their own separate projects. The project I went with was called SCOPE, and it was run by the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. So I initially went south with SCOPE, but whereas most people left at the end of the summer, I stayed. I stayed for a year and a half, and then I went to Chicago and continued my involvement. Mm -hmm. um, I was probably an incipient feminist when I was at Berkeley, but I did not understand it. Mm -hmm. You know, it was just a word to me. I knew that there was something wrong when uh, men could take certain classes and women couldn't take certain classes. Mm -hmm. There were other things that I saw were wrong. But there are also things I didn't see. For example, I not only never had a woman professor in my four years at Berkeley, mm -hmm. I never saw a woman professor in my four years at Berkeley. And worse yet, I didn't even notice that. Mm -hmm. It seemed so natural mm -hmm. that all professors were men that it just never occurred to me that there was something wrong with that. So I saw some things and I didn't see other things. ¿Y qué hizo entonces que eh, en ese momento te dieras cuenta de que había que hacer una defensa de los derechos de las mujeres y que uh, cuando fuiste a Chicago con Sulamit Firestone fundaras esos, uno de esos primeros grupos de, de mujeres. ¿no? ¿Cómo llegasteis a la idea de que era necesario defender las, los intereses, los derechos de las mujeres de forma, de forma colectiva y dar origen a lo que caracterizó la segunda ola de feminismo en, en tu país? Well, that too goes back to the civil rights movement, because when I was working in the South, well, I certainly observed that black women were secondary to black men. They weren't as secondary as was true in the white world I had come from. Mm -hmm. For example, in the white world, a woman only had status through her husband. Mm -hmm. What she did on her own didn't matter, only what her husband did. In the black world, in the South, while a woman did get status from her husband, she could also get status on her own as a community leader, as a teacher. So in, in a very real sense, within the black community, black women had more presence, more status than they did in the white community. I observed all these things. Mm -hmm. I also observed the language of inequality, 
and the structure of the thought patterns of inequality. And then when I was in Chicago, armed with these new ways of seeing things, I began to see the many ways women were denied rights and were discriminated against that I hadn't seen in Berkeley, mm -hmm. when I did not have all of these ideas. Um, I met Shuley at a conference. The conference was a New Left conference, mm -hmm. and it was called Intending to Run a Left-Wing Political Ticket for President to Raise Left-Wing Issues. Um, there was a women's caucus there. Now, the purpose of the women's caucus was not to talk about women's issues, but to talk about organizing women for left-wing issues. However, many of us in that caucus wanted to talk about women's issues. Shuley was one of those. She spoke up. I spoke up. There were some other women who spoke up. Uh, and we wrote a resolution, which we wanted to present to the main body, mm -hmm. on issues that affected women, not how women was going to organize against the war. But when we took that resolution to the leader of the conference and said, this is the Women's Caucus resolution, he wouldn't pay any attention to it. He said, we're not here to discuss women's problems. He literally patted Shuley on the head and said, cool down, little girl. Women's issues are not important. So this made us mad. <laughs> Obviously, <laughs> can imagine. <laughs> and I had been collecting the names of people who had expressed interest in women's issues. And after the conference was over, Shuley and I called all the people on my list, about 20 or 30, and we invited them to my apartment to talk. Maybe 10 came, but that was the beginning of the first group. That was the group that we called the West Side Group, mostly because it met in my apartment on the west side of Chicago. Um, some of the women in that group later organized other groups in Chicago. Um, Shuley went to New York, where she had been given the name of a couple other women who had expressed interest in women's issues, and she contacted them, and they began to organize groups in New York. So Chicago organized before New York. <laughs> I see. Everyone thinks New York was the beginning. It wasn't. New York was late uh, by a few months. Mm -hmm. um, there were, in fact, five early groups that organized around the country independently of each other, of which Chicago was one. But that's how we got started. Initially, we didn't really know what to do. The people in these groups either came out of the civil rights movement, like I did. Um, even Shuley had some experience in the civil rights movement. She had not gone south. She didn't have as much as I did. But she had picketed on civil rights issues. Some women had gone south for Freedom Summer in 1964. Mm -hmm. um, our other women came out of, the, out of SDS. And SDS was actually a very chauvinistic organization. Uh, the men in SDS, for the most part, put women in two categories, the workers and the wives. So you were there for to give the men sex and sucker, or you were there to do all of the office work, the printing of the leaflets. Uh, but you still had the same pattern that I had observed both in the South and in the political world in California, where the men did the talking and the women did the work. That was the pattern. And that's what we began, to, we began to dissect and to criticize. That's where we started from. And we took it on from there. Eh, entrando ya en, en alguna de tus eh, publicaciones más relevantes, me gustaría comentar el, el asunto de la tiranía de la falta de estructuras, que es un, un escrito que tuvo bueno, mucha influencia incluso aquí en, en, en el Estado español. En él abordas algunas de estas cuestiones que estabas comentando sobre el poder y el papel eh, que juegan las mujeres en las organizaciones. ¿Qué, ¿Qué crees que podríamos rescatar de, de ese escrito tuyo uh, para aplicarlos a los debates que estamos teniendo en el momento en el momento presente? Well, there wasn't exactly a debate. These young these groups of young women that I talked about rebelled against authority, mm -hmm. and part of rebelling against authority was a rebellion against hierarchy and structure. 
they took what was probably a very good, healthy debate, they took it to an extreme. So when they got, so in the West Side group, for example, but it was also true in other groups, they did not want to select any leaders. They did not want to select someone to talk to the press. They wanted everything to be structuralist. And a lot of this, in turn, actually did come from the civil rights movement. SNCC, which was a civil rights organization, had started the trend. They didn't take it as far, but they actually started that trend. Um, but the women in the group didn't want any structure. Yet, as I sat in those group meetings, and as I learned from talking to people, a structure, in fact, did emerge. But it was a structure of informal relationships, of friends, of people who talked to each other, who, in effect, made the decisions outside the group and brought them back to the group so that the group didn't really make the decisions. That's what I observed. And that's what I wrote about in Tyranny of Structurelessness. At that time, I had no idea <laughs> that the same pattern or problem was showing up in groups having nothing to do with women mm -hmm. and not even confined to the US or to those groups which were influenced by the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. It was literally going on all over the world. Mm -hmm. uh, it's only when I, after Tyranny was published and I began to get responses from it that I realized that this was not just a little problem of a little group, but a big problem of a big, a big group, that younger people in their rebellion against authority were taking it to an extreme, and by making it impossible for groups to make decisions uh, collectively and rationally, they were hamstringing themselves. So that's how tyranny came to be. Mm -hmm. well, eh, efectivamente, tú analizaste esta cuestión en organizaciones exclusivamente de mujeres, pero eh, probablemente las organizaciones mixtas tienen no solo esos problemas, sino, sino todavía más. ¿no? Sin embargo, si queremos acceder al poder político, parece inevitable que participemos en organizaciones mixtas. ¿Tú crees que es importante que las mujeres accedan al poder político? ¿Y por qué? ¿Y cómo sobrevivir a, a esas estructuras con lógicas tan masculinizadas? Well, basically, you need a critical mass of women, which is roughly between 20 and 30 percent. When you have less than 20 percent women, individuals get isolated, they get ignored, even when they speak out. When you have more than 30 percent, they tend to blend in. But when you have that critical mass, it says that roughly between 20 and 30 percent, women can organize as a group and speak out as a group and support each other as a group. Mm -hmm. So in these mixed organizations, you want to first achieve that critical mass, get enough women in them that you have still the group solidarity but not the individual isolation, and to speak up as a mass. So that if one woman says something in a group meeting which is ignored by the men, other women will get up and say, as she said, and continue on the debate. Mm -hmm. There's this enormous tendency in traditional mixed groups that ideas are attributed to men, but if it's a woman's idea, it's either it's not attributed at all or it's attributed to the next man who articulates that. Mm -hmm. Women have to consciously fight against that, have to consciously say, as she said, um, this is a good idea. But they also have to have that sense of groupness that comes when you know that another woman will back you up if you say something. Mm -hmm. um, so I do recommend in mixed groups that women work together. Sometimes they need to organize together as a separate caucus. Sometimes they don't. That depends on the group. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they can find influential men who will work with them, who will make a point of calling on them to speak and acknowledging them. There are good men out there. Mm -hmm. Um, but when men get pulled into the traditional male culture, then they just see each other as competitors and women merely as support services. Mm -hmm. So not all men are good men. Mm -hmm. Some are, some aren't. Um, 
But that's basically what you need to do, is you need to reach the critical mass, and then women need to consciously work together. ¿Qué pasa cuando las mujeres acceden a posiciones de liderazgo y poder? Por ejemplo, en, las última, en la última campaña electoral a las presidenciales de Estados Unidos, en el bando de demócrata hubo una dura pugna entre Hillary Clinton y Bernie Sanders por el liderazgo. ¿Cómo respondió el movimiento feminista? ¿Se plantearon dudas sobre apoyar a Hillary en tanto que mujer, pero también en tanto que parte del, del establishment? ¿Y tú crees que una vez elegida candidata eh, cometió un error al no buscar una alianza con Sanders? Everyone expected Clinton to be the candidate. I think even Bernie Sanders expected Clinton to be the candidate. He ran for president. Remember, he was not a Democrat. <laughs> he ran. He was an independent who was really a socialist. Um, which is something that's hard to be in the United States. Uh, he became a Democrat and ran to pull Hillary to the left. He succeeded. He did pull her to the left. Now, many of his supporters still did not like her, still did not want her. I know, I, I know many of his supporters really thought that he might win the nomination. I don't think Bernie ever thought that, and I know that the... Um, political analyst who study these things never thought that. Indeed, most people were surprised that he did as well as he did. That reflected something going on in the electorate that no one knew was there. But as soon as she got the nomination, Bernie became a top supporter. I was at the Democratic Convention. I watched the whole thing. Uh, Hillary acknowledged him at the convention. He supported her. He told his supporters to support her. He campaign for her, had she won, he would have been a major influence. He may or may not have been brought into the cabinet. He may not have wanted to be in the cabinet, but either way, he would have been a major influence. So when Hillary lost, Bernie lost. Now, as for women and feminists, that really stretched the gamut. There were certainly women who supported Hillary from the beginning and resented Bernie and resented anyone who didn't support Hillary. That group exists. But I can tell you there were also women who did not like Hillary because she was establishment. There were other women who did not like her because she did not leave Bill Clinton after he was found to have engaged in some improper behavior. Um, they, I, I, I would li watch their debates. I can say I listened to their debates, but I watched their debates online, and many of them said they could never vote for her, and they debated what to do. I don't think this was a large group, but there were feminists who would not support her and debated what to do with her. I think the general consensus was that if you lived in a state that was either definitely going to, definitely red or definitely blue, definitely Republican or definitely Democrat, do whatever you like. But if you lived in a state in which was what we call a battleground state, where it, which might go either way, it was better to um, vote for Hillary even if you didn't like her. That was sort of the consensus in the debate among those women who didn't like her. Uh, but there really was a range. There was, you cannot say simply feminists, all feminists supported her or that radical feminists opposed her. There, there really was a range. For the most part, feminists supported her. Certainly, the major feminist organizations, like the National Organization for Women, supported her. Uh, the young women that uh, the women who had been young women in the 1960s, who are no longer young today, some of those were still very left and couldn't bring themselves to do that. So there was a range. Certainly, no one was supporting Trump. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I can definitely tell you that. <laughs> but but there, there was a debate on whether or not to support Hillary because she was establishment. Bueno, al final, como todas sabemos, Trump ganó las elecciones y su llegada al poder generó una oleada de protestas en todo el, en todo el país. ¿Cuáles son los problemas que a, tu juicio, eh, a los que a tu juicio se enfrentan las mujeres ahora mismo en Estados Unidos con un presidente como como Trump, ¿está suponiendo un freno o, o, o un retroceso en lo que se refiere a los derechos de las mujeres? Well, one of the biggest setback is going to be in the selection of federal judges. Uh, the president appoints federal judges and the Senate confirms them. And of course, we have a Republican 
Senate. Uh, when Obama was president, the Republican Senate refused to confirm his choices, creating a lot of openings. Now we have a Republican president and a Republican Senate, which, if it stays Republican, may be able to confirm federal judges. I will tell you from my days in the Civil Rights Movement, or more accurately, the study I have made of the Civil Rights Movement years later, that federal judges were extremely important in enforcing the law to remove segregation. And federal judges will continue to be important for all issues that affect women, in particular abortion and birth control, but not just, not just that. And federal judges hold their appointments for life. Mm -hmm. So the fact that there are so many vacancies that Trump can appoint with the approval of the Senate portends a very long period of judges who will not support women's rights. That's the biggest problem that the Trump election is leaving women. It's subtle, you can't see it, doesn't hit you in the face right now, but anyone who knows politics and knows U.S. politics knows that the appointment of federal judges will have a very long-term effect on women's rights in this country. En, en esta elección de jueces federales um, no hay una cuota que exija que, que un porcentaje uh, sea, sea de, de propuestos sean mujeres. Oh, no. No, absolutely not. No. Uh, no, we're talking about selection of federal judges, not, not election. No, absolutely not. And, and indeed, uh, until, I'm trying to remember which administration it was, there were virtually no women federal judges. But I must also say, at least what I learned from civil rights, just having a woman as a federal judge does not by itself guarantee a decision that I would like. Uh, and in fact, there's some women who are currently federal judges who are making some decisions that I think are very contrary to the values that I and feminist hold. So that being female by itself doesn't guarantee anything. Um, but no, there is no requirement for parity uh, in our equality in judges, um, absolutely, absolutely not. Y aparte de esto que, que tiene su gravedad, um, dirías que hay otras áreas en las que los derechos de las mujeres puedan haberse visto afectados con Trump en el poder? Sure, he, he, he's changing many regulations. Uh, one of these, again, has to do with abortion and birth control. Mm -hmm. At this point, he's changed the rule about who can get uh, federal support. At this point, no organization which also does abortions can get any kind of federal money even for work that does not involve abortion. That's, that's one of the things that Trump, Trump is changing. Mm -hmm. um, so anything that involves abortion and birth control is going to be affected by, by Trump. Then we have this other really tricky issue, which the right wing likes to call religious freedom. Mm -hmm. um, the right wing is saying employers should have religious freedom to uh, hire and fire or provide information or support in accordance with their own values. Now, the way this has appeared so far has to do with insurance. Can uh, an employer who does not believe in birth control be required to provide health insurance which pays for birth control? The federal court has held no. Now imagine that spreading. <laughs> imagine that idea spreading so that if, if, if you have an employer who says, it violates my religious values to put a woman in position of authority over a man. That hasn't happened yet, mm -hmm. but it could. Mm -hmm. um, now, when we had cases like that concerning race, 40 years ago, the courts clearly said no. But different judges, different issues involving uh, women and sex and gender, the courts might, held, might hold yes. So they might bring in a lot of things that restrict women's opportunities under the guise of supporting religious liberty. Mm -hmm. That is something that is out there looming on the horizon. It hasn't happened yet, but you can see it coming. Mm 
-hmm. And if the court, if, and that's why I said the importance, the appointment of judges was so important, because Trump can change the regulations, Congress can change the law, but ultimately it's those federal judges who will decide if what is what is the what is the constitutional interpretation of those regulations and those laws. Mm -hmm. uh, and if Trump says you could use religious liberty as a reason not to hire women, mm -hmm. and the courts uphold it, we will go back to the dark ages. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm. Bueno, afortunadamente parece que, que en buena medida, como reacciona Trump, en las próximas elecciones que habrá este año al Congreso y al Senado en Estados Unidos, eh, se van a presentar muchas más mujeres que en ocasiones anteriores. Sin embargo, es, es, es llamativo el escaso porcentaje de mujeres en las, cámara, en, la cámara, en las cámaras de representantes. Un 20% en el Senado, men, menos del 20% en el Congreso. ¿No debería haber algún tipo de regulación que favoreciera una mayor presencia de mujeres en, en, en estas cámaras? Okay. First of all, it would be very... Under our constitutional system, you can't regulate it. Okay. I, I, under other European party systems, you can, but you can't under our constitutional system. So individuals decide they're going to run. The parties can recruit them, and there are and many part. And both the Democrat and the Republican Party have, at different times, gone out of their way to recruit women and to support women, and the voters can vote for them. But we cannot have a law that says you have to have so many women. It's just not possible under, under our system. I will have to thank Donald Trump for one thing. By getting elected, he basically pushed women into activism. Women were so appalled at the, I shouldn't say not, not all women, because a lot of women voted for Trump, but a rather large number of women were so appalled that the electors would vote for this man who believed in grabbing women by the pussy and otherwise denigrated women. They were so outraged that they have been coming out in numbers to march and to do things. And candidates, and they've also been running for office in a way that they didn't run before. And as candidates for office, they have been remarkably successful. They have been particularly successful in Democratic primaries where you have Democratic voters. But they have also been successful in some elections in which you had both Republicans and Democrats running against each other. Now, when you say low percentages, in fact, our percentages of women have been increasing for years. But there's an important fact that most people don't know. The percentages of women who are elected officials has been increasing if they are Democrats. It has not been increasing in the Republican Party. So you look at the 20% of the senators who are, who are female, they're all but a couple are Democrats. If you look at the history of women going into the Senate, you see that the percent who were Republican first flatlined and then went down. So the reality is, at this point in time, to elect more women, you have to elect more Democrats. That was not always true, but it is true now. And no one talks about that. No one really looks at the partisan division in the selection of women. But if the women who have been marching start running for office, you're going to see a lot more of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Bueno, mirando haciendo toda esta trayectoria y mirando el mundo desde los 70 hasta ahora o desde los 60 hasta ahora, podríamos decir que, que hemos experimentado importantes transformaciones y que las referidas a la situación de las mujeres probablemente sean de las más, de las más relevantes. ¿no? Um, ¿Qué papel jugó el movimiento feminista en este cambio de modelo social? O si podemos formularlo de otra cosa, ¿qué le debemos las mujeres y el conjunto de la sociedad al movimiento feminista? Well, quite a bit. <laughs> um, um, feminists developed the ideas. And they also developed the pressure groups to put those ideas into action. Now, clearly, a lot of other people had to be receptive to those ideas. And clearly, other kinds of changes have made a big difference. Uh, but feminists developed the ideas. Feminists developed the theory. 
and they develop the organizations to translate that theory into real laws and real practices. We're at an interesting period right now. When my generation was trying to make change, we looked to the law as the source of those changes. One of the things we learned is the law is not self-executing. You have to go beyond the law. The kinds of problems that women are dealing with today aren't necessarily subject to legal change. They're very much cultural. We have to change the culture. Um, this business about uh, putting your hands where they don't belong is a, good, is a classic example of that. That's not law. That's culture. Uh, either you live in a culture in which men are discouraged from doing that, or you live in a culture which no one pays attention, or a culture in which men are encouraged in doing that because it's part of being a man. Our culture is a little bit in between, and we're changing that culture. That's what the current marches and the current rise up of women really has as its basis, is to change the cultural attitude about how men and women relate to each other and can um, work together in, in, in the same environment. It's a, so we are entering in an area in which we're going to try to change how people think. And we will have to wait and see how successful we are. A pesar de todos esos eh, um, éxitos que hemos tenido, um, también hay reivindicaciones que se hacían en los 60 y en los 70 y que todavía no hemos logrado. Por ejemplo, vinculado a los derechos sexuales y reproductivos, el, el derecho al aborto. ¿Por qué crees que eso ha sucedido así? The movement to allow women to have abortions preceded the early women's movement that I was a part of. It was originally a movement of doctors who wanted to be allowed to treat their patients and, and provide for their patients the way they thought was best for the patient, regardless of, of the law. But the law was illegal at that time. Um, when the women's movement emerged, it quickly realized that this was very much a women's issue, the right to control your own body. So they co-opted that issue and they translated it from the right of doctor-patient relationships into the right to control your own body. The reason we had an early victory, which was in a Supreme Court decision, 1973, um, was because the movement had been going on for some time. It, 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 it seemed early, but only because it had been around for some time. Uh, it also provoked an enormous backlash. In fact, there were a large number of people out there, including about equally divided between men and women, who did not believe in abortion, who thought it was immoral and did not want it to be legal. That movement has gained strength. It hasn't, it hasn't, it hasn't uh, dissolved its gained strength. A lot, of the other, a lot of the other opposition to women's issues, in fact, has dissolved over the years. The opposition to women working. You know, when I when I was young, uh, the general belief was that a married woman should not work if her husband could support her. That's gone. <laughs> That's absolutely gone. But the belief that um, a woman should control her own body has not yet become um, sufficiently popular. Mm -hmm. um, there is still a belief that the fetus has rights independent of the woman who's carrying that fetus. And that movement has gained strength. Um, it's also divided the parties. Uh, they would say there was no party divide on the issue of birth control and abortion in the 1950s, in the 1960s. Beginning in the 1970s, it began to divide the parties. Um, so that now, if you're a Republican, you really have to be opposed to abortion and sometimes opposed to birth control. If you're a Democrat, at least if you want to run for office, you basically have to be in favor of it. It's become very much a partisan issue, which again, it wasn't years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, part of the reason it has um, sustained for so long is because it's a highly partisan issue, when some of those other issues just were not partisan. but. Yes, that birth control, abortion, and abortion is in turn spread to birth control. 
Keep in mind that birth control, even for married couples, was not always legal before 1965. So 65, um, the courts ruled that doctors can prescribe birth control for married couples, not unmarried, married couples. 73, they said that at least to the point of viability, a woman and a doctor can decide what to do with her fetus. Um, but there is opposition against all of that. And that opposition is still there. Sí. Bueno, uh, para ir terminando, quería hacerte una pregunta respecto a, a estos movimientos feministas, um, bueno, estos, estos movimientos, este despertar de la conciencia feminista en, en este año, ¿no? Después de unas décadas en las que el movimiento feminista tuvo una actividad, vamos a decir, modesta, um, ha habido pues, una presencia pública en muchos lugares muy, muy llamativa, desde las manifestaciones anti-Trump, de las que hablábamos antes, pero también, por ejemplo, aquí en las marchas del 8 de marzo, en Latinoamérica también, la mayor visibilidad frente a las agresiones sexuales, el acoso, las denuncias de, la, de, de las mujeres que están en el mundo de la, del cine, etc. ¿no? ¿A qué crees que se debe este despertar de la conciencia feminista? ¿Crees que es una cuestión puntual o estamos ante un punto de inflexión en el feminismo? Tal vez estamos ante una nueva ola. That is a very hard question. <laughs> uh, I have studied many, many social movements over a long historical period, and the one thing I know for sure is it's really hard to predict. <laughs> you can see it when it's over, but to see it coming, for example. In 1966, a very an important woman sociologist published an essay on why we will not see a new feminist movement. 66. Uh, in 1959, the former chairman of the Democratic Party published an article on why will why we will never have a woman president. <laughs> it's very hard to see these things coming. Um, we can say historically there are waves of protest. Uh, the waves tend to happen every 30 or 40 years, but it's not cyclical. You, can, you, know, you can't say 40 years from now we'll have another wave, but you can see over time they tend to happen that period. Social movements tend to cluster together, but again, not always. There are times when, when some movements thrive and other ideas don't thrive. Uh, what I, when, when, the first, when the mass women's movement march happened a year ago, I was amazed. I've never seen anything like that. But I certainly couldn't have said there will be more. Now we've had a second, uh, an anniversary march. This was not one big march, but in our country there were something like 240 marches in different cities all over the country. New York was the biggest, and it was big. <laughs> so maybe we are getting way ready for another wave of feminism. Maybe we are getting ready for another wave, not just of feminism, but of a whole series of issues, because they often do cl cluster together. Um, I would certainly say the signs are there, but I would be unwise to boldly predict that it would happen because I have seen those signs go up and go down. <laughs> Bueno, sí, ya sabemos que, que las ciencias sociales no, no son predictivas de esa manera, ¿no? Um, ya para terminar, querría preguntarte, ¿cuáles crees que son, en tu, en tu opinión, los grandes retos feministas que vamos a tener que, que afrontar en el futuro? ¿Y cómo crees que debemos lograrlos? ¿Crees que tenemos que apostar por algún tipo de, de, de cuestión organizativa específica? Well, first of all, let me take the reverse. One thing I have observed in is that when new social movements, real ones, not just as little flurries happen, it generally gives birth to new organizations. You generally don't have old organizations who then go into new fields. So your second question is, look for the new organizations. Um, and what's happening with the women's marches might be that. They haven't turned it into an organization yet, but it might be that. But look for the new organizations, don't look to follow the old. The old may not die, but they're not going to be the leaders into new areas if we're really having a movement, a movement surge. 
Um, okay, the greatest feminist challenges, frankly, have to do with men. Mm -hmm. um, the movement of my generation was to open the doors for women to do the things that men could do and were denied to women. We've made a lot of progress there. Not total progress, but a lot of progress. The hard part is that in order to achieve any kind of equality in those areas, you also have to make it possible for men to do the kinds of things traditionally restricted to women, like stay home and take care of children, um, or to share equally in the burdens of family and work, um, or to be willing to work for a woman, which a lot of men still aren't. So a lot of the changes that we need to see to attain real equality involve changing cultural attitudes and male attitudes so that men can do what women have always done in order to allow women to do what men have always done. Pero eso supondría un cambio de estructura económica, por ejemplo. Maybe. I, that's, that's hard to say. Bueno, pues nada, muchísimas gracias. Ha sido un placer tenerte aquí y haberte podido entrevistar. Thank you. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed, I enjoyed the opportunity.